We are so blessed in Brunswick to have so many talented musicians. Thank you, Ashley and Dottie, for always being willing to share your gift with us. And of course, Bev, you as well. You're not recognized very often, but you play for us often. And there are many ladies who play for us. Roberta, uh, the list goes on. Thank you for blessing us so abundantly with your talent. I'm going to be reading from Hebrews chapter 1, verses 1 through 3. And I'll be reading from the New King James Version, and you can follow along most likely behind me on screen or in your own Bible. God, who at various times and in various ways spoke in times past to the fathers by the prophets, has in these last days spoken to us by his Son, whom he has appointed heir of all things, through whom also he made the worlds, who, being the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person, and upholding all things by the word of his power, when he had by himself purged our sins, sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. Good morning, Brunswick. It's good to be here again. I, a few months ago, received an email from Peter DePete and uh, to the effect of, are you going to be up in this summer? Uh, could you preach for us? And something to the effect of, our pastor is gone or something like that. And I said, oh, pastor's on vacation, you know, get, and uh, uh, I didn't read it that carefully. I say, I'll be here July 21, good, good, good. Please pray for our pastor search. What? <laughs> I went back and reread and discovered uh, a little surprise happened. So uh, uh, I'm glad I can be of service today. The problem is, is that as I was wrestling for a couple months, what am I going to preach about up here? Try to make a list of what I've already preached, you know, and so forth. And uh, my wife was giving me suggestions and, and uh, so forth. And then all of a sudden, Peter emails me, can you preach on the Trinity? And I said, sure. And then I said to myself, one sermon on the Trinity is about like trying to preach the whole book of Daniel in one sermon. 
So this is not going to be a light duty sermon today. Uh, it is going to be in kind of two sections. The first section we got to orient you to what's going on in Adventism and some Trinity issues and history and the like. And then we're going to move to a study of Hebrews 1 and end on a biblical and some practical applications. So we will get there, but this is, this is not a pablum sermon today uh, as a result. And uh, yes, I'm supposed to remind everyone after the service uh, about the prayer for the new pastor search after the service. So I'm making the announcement now in case I forget Leno <laughs> uh, later. Rob's going to wave at me to remind me at the benediction, I think, so this way. So it's good to be here, and it's good to enjoy summer nights in the 50s. I forgot what that's like, and uh, last summer it was hot, so it was nice uh, to have some cool New England weather again uh, as an old uh, transplanted Yankee uh, down under in the depths of Tennessee. Now, if we can push the right button here, everything should be... There we are. Also, a quick word. Uh, it's nice to have a church blessed with good musical talent. I was going to add that to myself. And, and since I'm depending on Bev for the closing hymn, I recant my challenge to you this morning at Sabbath school. <laughs> and uh, uh, when I grow up, I hope to play the piano like she does. The um, um, children out there taking piano lessons, uh, your mother and dad are right. You hate it now, but if you stop, you'll kick yourself later. And I'm kicking myself years later because I stopped. So stick with it, and then you can be a blessing like Beverly. I also need to thank the graciousness of your church secretary. After service, I need to know who Tina Hume is because she'd email me and she would... Uh, have to wait five days for a response because I was in sabbatical, busy doing sabbatical things and not watching my email, but she, she bore with it with, with grace, and so it would be nice to get a face and a name connected in my head if you're here today, Tina, uh, that way. We're at an unprecedented time, not only in Earth's history, but I think in Adventist church history. And it seems to me that we've headed back to the late 1840s. And just as in the early movement we had all sorts of competing ideas and a, quite a disunity of what's what doctrinally in this, and we took some time to work it out, uh, it finally uh, became an organized entity in the early 1860s. We seem to be regressing into private interpretation and all sorts of views out there. And one of the things that has revived in the last 15, 20 years, uh, and especially probably in the last decade, is a rise of anti-Trinitarian Seventh-day Adventists. And they're everywhere, though they tend to be less visible in a church with a highly educated element in it, like Brunswick with your medical professionals and stuff, you're more likely to find them in the smaller churches where they can be a big fish in a small pond and wield more influence kind of a thing. But they're out there. And, uh, and about 20 years ago, when we went to Tennessee for me to teach at Southern, very quickly, I had never hardly heard of anti-Trinitarians up here in New England, southern and northern, man, I was running into it quickly down there uh, in the Southern Union. We got a lot of it down there. But with the Internet and everything else, it's everywhere. And their favorite, basically, favorite ploy is that they will pull out quotations from people like James White and um, Joseph Bates, among others, Adventist pioneers of the founding generation, especially big ones like White and Bates, who wrote statements about the unbiblical doctrine of the Trinity and it, this nonsensical Catholic doctrine, etc., etc., etc. And thus our current 
statement of beliefs in the 28 fundamentals with a triune Godhead, though we don't think we use the word Trinity, actually. It's just a Godhead language. But uh, we have apostatized, and we need to go back to the 1840s. In reality, in my opinion, they are not appealing to the scripture. They're appealing to a snapshot of Adventist tradition, and they're basically saying that the mid-1840s, late-1840s James White theology is the true Adventism, and anything that's progressed since then is a diversion from real Adventism, so there's no room to grow and develop. So in reality, they are appealing to church tradition. But they are um, then cobbling certain Bible texts and certain Ellen White quotes to bolster their position. And when you give them, shall I say, bluntly Trinitarian statements of Ellen White, you're told that these statements are fabricated by the White estate to fit in with the progressive Adventist church and were not written by Ellen White herself. So the White estate has done a study where they can take you document by document back to her own pencil on paper handwriting, uh, which wasn't fabricated. But then they say, well, even that's fabric. You know, you, there's a point where you're immune to evidence, you know what I'm saying? And so this is... Uh, this is what we're grappling with in corners of Adventism and particularly in uh, more professedly very conservative corners of Adventism. Uh, it's bigger problems in Africa and South America and so forth uh, as well. Um, uh, but I bet if you get into rural Maine, New Hampshire, rural Massachusetts, you're going to find uh, this stuff going on too, again, thanks to the Internet and the like. And the irony is that these controversies are turning us into arguing over the Adventist church fathers the way Catholics argue over the classic church fathers. And we're forgetting the Bible, in my opinion, as a result. By the way, same thing with women's ordination. When I was on the GC task, uh, you had one group trying to find Adventist pioneers favorable to women and Adventist pioneers arguing against women, and I'm like, who cares about the pioneers? I want to know what the Bible says. <laughs> oh, kind of a thing, right? And so various issues tempt us to start arguing over tradition instead of doing our good biblical homework, and this is one of them. Now, the current SDA movement that I am running into repeatedly and in fact, many of my weekends in churches is a three-sermon series on the Trinity or something like this. Um, they believe in only a two-person Godhead, Father and Son. Holy Spirit is not a person. It's just an, some kind of extension of God's personal presence, but it's not a separate person. A very few of them take an odd twist, um, reviving an old heresy called modalism, uh, full modalism said there's only one person who manifests himself in three ways, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, but it's only one person, three modes. These people believe in two persons, but there are a few of them that argue that the Holy Spirit is merely Christ unincarnated. Uh, so he, he comes to us as the Holy Spirit so he can be omnipresent and separates from his humanity and so the Holy Spirit in Christ, for a very small number of these people, is one person in two modes. Uh, nothing new under the sun. Modalism was way back there. And we long decided that wasn't good. But the one thing we learned from history is that we don't learn from history. In particular, with this two-person Godhead... It's very crucial to them that the Son was not just begotten in the incarnate form, but he must have been begotten somewhere back in eternity 
so that it's literally father and son. And when I've challenged a number of these anti-Trinitarians, if the father precedes the son in existence, they say yes. So, and then they try to say no while they still say yes. Uh, that, well, the son was hidden in the father like Eve was hidden in Adam and the way Eve was brought out of Adam, the son was brought out of the father. I'm like, wait a minute, Eve did not pre-exist in Adam. God took a rib and built Eve. You follow me? But they, you get this kind of thinking. So the point is, these Adventist Trinitarians, anti-Trinitarians seem to believe that there was a point where the son really doesn't exist in any visible way then way back, somewhere outside of time and space, God begat this son so that there's always been a hierarchical father-son relationship even though they're supposedly equal. And they believe that the mainline Adventist teaching, which would seem to deny that pre-existence of one over the other, is a denial thus of the eternal sonship of Christ and therefore you're denying the sonship of Christ and that's a salvation issue. Unless you confess the eternal sonship of the Christ, you're lost. And that's why they make and agitate and so forth because they think we're all lost and they're trying to save us. Uh, kind of a thing. So that's the short little version of, of what's going on. But again, it tends to be fueled by statements from people like James White, Uriah Smith, uh, and the like. Now, I can't obviously cover everything today, so I'm going to give you two resources if you want to do a little research on your own. One is that your ABC, the GC, back, whew, early 2000s or so, mid-2000s, um, published a book, Right across the top in big letters, Trinity. I think it's like the Trinity. Purpley blue color, edited by Jerry Moon and a couple of other seminary professors. And it's about that thick. It's a nice book. It covers the basics of Adventist history and the ins and outs of what was going on in early Adventism and some biblical data. It's not a heavy systematic theology. It's written for average people to be able to read it. But it, it covers the basics quite well. And that's a good book that you can get. Second resource would be, as former president of Adventist Theological Society, we have a website called Perspective Digest, all one word, perspectivedigest.org. So Perspective Digest is kind of our Reader's Digest version of scholarly works for the average person to read papers from our meetings and stuff. And, but the presidents during our two-year terms supply four presidential little columns, a couple pages each year. So I have eight of them in there. Five or six of them I'm dealing with these Trinity issues. And I've got two more coming with past presidents columns that's dealing with the Hebrews text I'm preaching on today. And so if you go to Perspective Digest and you put in Bauer, You'll see my stuff. He put in Trinity. There's all sorts of stuff uh, in there that can be very helpful, seminary professors and so forth. Uh, you can get a lot of help at perspectivedigest.org if you wish to uh, do So those are two quick um, sources um, that can give you some good Adventist perspectives on what's going on and you know, the uniquely Adventist issues, et cetera, et cetera. Now, one of the challenges of dealing with these folk is the problem of terminology because they act like Trinity means just one thing. And the reality is it depends on which branch of Christianity you're in exactly what Trinity means. In a way, there's kind of three levels, and I'll work backwards. There's the creedal Trinity, officially brought to creedal form in A.D. 381, at the Council of Constantinople, so late 4th century. And this is especially held by your higher magisterial Catholic, Episcopal, Anglican, Eastern Orthodox, etc. But the Eastern Orthodox from Catholics take the same creed and they've got some slightly different 
nuancing of that same creed. So what the Trinity means to a Greek Orthodox and a Roman Catholic isn't quite the same thing, though it's very close. Okay. Then you back down to the less magisterial churches who like to go with the Nicene Creed from roughly 60 years earlier. And the Nicene Creed is Trinitarian, but not to the level of precise definition of the creedal Constantinople one. And so people who are only into the Nicene Creed will see the Trinity somewhat differently than somebody who's fully the Constantinople Catholic Orthodox Creed. And then there's us Adventists who don't believe in creeds. <laughs> And our Trinity Godhead and doctrine is even less precise and more open than Nicaea. And what I would like to contend uh, from my own research and from the scholarship of some Ellen White experts and Adventist history experts, I am thoroughly convinced that when James White used the word Trinity, he was using it in an ultra-precise way of the Roman Catholic creed. For White and Bates, Trinity meant Constantinople Roman Catholic and only that. And the current anti-Trinitarians will not recognize that level of precision to understand what they're reading in the pioneers. And so you read a 21st century definition of pluralism of Trinity in the James White statements and you make him say things he wasn't saying because he was using the word very, very precisely. Just of Constantinople and the Roman Catholic creed. Ditto with Joseph Bates this way. Now, moving out to Christianity in general. Christianity in general, particularly, again, the more mainline denominations, the Trinity is the distinctive doctrine that separates Christianity from all others. They view the Trinity kind of the way Adventists view the Sabbath, you know, that special mark that separates and distinguishes everyone, you know. For mainline Christianity... That's the Trinity, the triune doctrine. So it's a major, major point of identity. And just like Adventist can get, what's the word I want? Overly pedantic with the Sabbath, Christianity can get overly vexed over the details of the Trinity and forget what it means. Just like we get so busy on the do's and don'ts of Sabbath, we forget the big picture. Same thing with Trinity. What's this here for? I don't know. In the name of the Father, Son, and we, we don't understand why it's important. We just know it's this distinctive mark uh, this way. So how did we get there as Christianity? Well, Early Adventism had the same problem as the early church, though on a lighter scale. We were opposed, right? Borderline persecution at times, but not unto death like the early church. But when you're under attack and defending your distinctive points of doctrine, in our case, Sabbath, spirit of prophecy, these kind of things, and everybody's attacking you in public newspapers and everywhere else, and you're busy defending these distinctive, the sanctuary and so forth, you don't have time to think about philosophical theology. And even more so, when being a Christian was a good way of getting yourself killed and you're trying not to be discovered, when you're in those kind of conditions, philosophical theology really isn't... You know, it's very existential. God be with me, protect me till tomorrow. <laughs> we don't worry about philosophy. But as Adventist church now has been established and accepted as a non-cult, 
and we don't have that. You know, when I was a kid, we were a cult, and the Mark of the Beast was coming next week. Right? Yeah. See? We've lost that, and the result is we now have room to be more philosophical. Ditto with the early church. And so it's not until the late 200s that the persecution is really waning, very late 200s. And as we enter the early 300s, the early 4th century, Constantine the emperor converts to Christianity in the ballpark of 312. So if the emperor is a Christian, professed Christian, it's certainly no longer an illegal religion. No more imperial persecution. No accident that, boom, the philosophical questions pop up, in this case, in the name of Arius. And Arius challenges our understanding of who Christ is. And for Arius, Christ was the first being God created. And then he used that being to create everything else. And so Christ is not the true God. He's some kind of semi-God or second-tier God because only the Father is fully God. And this is the view in slightly modified form held by Jehovah's Witnesses today. They are Arian, fundamentally. Okay? And part of Arius's exposition some proof text, but it also involved Neoplatonic philosophy because starting around 125 to 150 on forward, increasingly the leaders of the church were becoming more and more Platonic philosophically. It's where the immortal soul comes from. And so by the time we get to the early 300s, Neoplatonism is a major theological force and he's using philosophical argumentation to bolster whatever proof text he has from the Bible. So what do you think the big cheese did? They said, well, we have the Bible text, the word was with God and the word was God, you know, etc. But we need a philosophical explanation of how this is possible. And they went to their platonic bag of tricks and began... And this is where James White says, uh-uh, you're going to be on the Bible. And what you have to understand is that in the Greek philosophical mindset, the substance that you are comprised of, that's the ground of your reality. To make a computer analogy, your substance is kind of like the operating system, right? Apple versus, um, I want to say Mac, but the Mac is Apple, um, PC, yeah, Apple versus PC, right? Your OS determines certain things, right, that you run and don't run. And so your substance functions like that operating system. So in order to be divine, you have to have the divine operating, the divine substance, okay? You have human substance, that's why you're human and operate like a human, okay? You're wired to operate like a human. If you had rabbit substance, then you would operate like a rabbit, right? Yeah. So they set out to prove Arius was wrong, not merely with biblical text, but they wanted to show that Christ was of the same substance as the Father. Because Arius was saying he was only of similar substance to the Father, but not the same. How do you do that? Well, they said, aha. We have in the Bible father-son language. And they take the father-son language of the incarnate Christ and they extrapolate it back into timeless eternity. It's always been father and son. And we know that human father and son is of the same substance because the father begets what's like him. And so I begin, remember in their worldview, in procreation, your essential nature came only from your father. You only got the accidental characteristics like eye, eye and hair color or temperament. That's all mom supplies, but your actual soul and everything came from your father alone. Mother was an incubator who added a few details. 
And so they said, aha, if they were father and son in here, they were father and son back there. And the reason they're father and son is that the father begat the son. But if the son is fully of the same substance as the father, his substance cannot have a beginning. Because God can't have a beginning, right? But if you're begotten, you have a beginning. A little problem here, right? So how did they solve it? Introduce the doctrine of the eternal begetting of the Son. The Father has eternally and always and still is begetting the Son. It's an everlasting process of him begetting and generating the Son. So that he can be of the same substance but not have any beginning. And in my view, it was this eternal begetting, which is nowhere in the Bible, that James White especially was not fond of. Because in his mind, it made Christ always dependent on the Father for his life. But if you're fully God, you're not dependent on anybody for your life. You follow me? Okay. And so this is where Adventist Trinity is different from the Creedal Trinity. And Ellen White follows her husband. You know the classic statements, and I'm blending two or three of them together in a paraphrase, but like her desire of ages, in Christ is life, unoriginal, unborrowed. What's the last word? Underived. And it's the unborrowed and underived that fly in the face of the eternal begetting doctrine. So they saw the classic trinity. Now, I don't think they fully understood the philosophy, but they saw that as diminishing Christ, and they did not want Christ diminished. And so this trinity doctrine with the eternal begetting, ah, that bad, bad. It's Catholic creed, it's not Bible. But our current anti-Trinitarians miss that whole context and just simplistically reduce the word, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, this way. By the way, the rest of the creeds then says that the Holy Spirit proceeds out of the Father and Son jointly the way the Son proceeds out of the Father. They won't use the word the Holy Spirit, they'll never say is begotten. But he's clearly somehow generated and proceeds from the joint being of the Father and Son, eternal procession, so that he has no beginning. Instead of leaving what the Bible kind of leaves as a mystery. But it's this three in one then, single substance, three persons, that is viewed as the absolute distinction that separates Christianity from everything else. Again, like the way Adventists fixate on the Sabbath, everyone else fixates on the Trinity. This is the importance of it uh, this way. Now, much more I could say, but I think that's enough orientation. Biblically, whatever we construct as a trinity is a theological construction. Uh, there really is f very few, if any places, very few places in the Bible where you just find bam, 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 all three. You know, like baptizing them in the name of the Father. So they share a name, you know, these kinds of texts. But it's very rare. We have to kind of a piece here and a piece here and a piece here and a piece here and, a piece here and start putting it together. But we do that in a number of other areas. Our doctrine of man is a theological construct based on evidences from all over the Bible. Okay? Our doctrine of the three-phase judgment. And there's no one text that puts all three phases together. Revelation 20 comes close in that you get two phases back to back. You know, the investigative phase that separates the 
lost from the saved, and then the last two phases that focus on the lost, with the uh, millennial judgment where we judge angels and so forth, right? Uh, men of Nineveh will judge the people of Christ's day. But we put that together from multiple sources, and it becomes a, a theological construct. The point is a theological construct is not necessarily bad. By the way, our doctrine of God is also a theological construct. And this is the challenge of theological construct. It's easy to forget your limits and start losing the difference between the text and your inferences from the text. And we start to build inference on the inference on the inference and forget that we're three steps removed from the text, okay? So when we make our construct, I like to stay no more than one inference out. After that, I have to admit I'm going out into philosophical land, which is a fun game to play, but don't put divine authority on it. You know. And such theological constructs, if we're not careful, can get out of control that way. They also can foster, look how smart I am. I put this together, you know. And... Uh, and the human pride. So there are some weaknesses we have to watch against as we go through this. Now, the problem with these controversies is it's actually pushing Adventism to form a creed in response, just as the early church formed a creed in response to Arius. We're being pushed into becoming Seventh-day Catholics which is what they claim to be not wanting to do. And it's a very interesting phenomenon. Now, one more orientation, then we get to the book of Hebrews. And the one I've already accelerated. Again, in the Adventist circles, the anti-Trinitarians think that if you have Christ absolutely co-eternal and not begotten until as a baby in Bethlehem, that you're denying the actual full sonship of Christ and therefore you're lost. That's one side of the issue. There's a different issue brewing in the evangelical world for the last 15 years that a number of authors have made a lot of money off of. And I'm going to introduce it here because it came up in the Theology of Ordination Study Committee. In fact, at the end of committee one, I predicted it's coming, and the first papers in two fulfilled my prophecy. There's a controversy in evangelicals, not over how many are in the Trinity and the oneness and all that stuff. The controversy is this. Is the Son of God eternally subordinate or was he not subordinate, became temporarily subordinate, and is no longer subordinate? Why? Has nothing to do with the doctrine of God. Has everything to do with women's ordination. Because the opponents of women's ordination in the evangelical world discovered, as the proponents, that neither side can put a biblical case together that just crushes the other side. There's enough ambiguity, right? But in looking for that crushing, knock it out once and for all, the anti-Trinitarians went, oh, correction, the anti-women's ordination went back to an old teaching that Christ has always been subordinate to the Father because what they argue is that they are equal in essence but unequal in function. And therefore, if the Godhead can be equal yet unequal, the image of God is going to be based on that same model. And thus, men and women are equal, but only men can lead. And so they need the eternal subordination of the Son in order to produce the eternal subordination of women. And they would never have gone there if had they not needed it for the gender issue. Guaranteed. 
guarantee. And so the temporary subordinationists tend to be more open to women's ordination, whereas if you oppose women's ordination in the evangelical world, you're almost guaranteed to be an eternal subordinationist. Okay? Wayne Grudem is the leading figure on eternal subordination and so forth on one side, Millard Erickson, temporary subordination. Excellent little book, Who's Tampering with the Trinity by Millard Erickson. Uh, highly recommend that one as well. With that in mind then, let's take a look at one of the most sublime passages on the divinity of Christ. And it's a passage that many of us don't think of because when we think of the divinity of Christ, we all want to go to John 1, right? And certainly John 1 is a powerful confession, but he's done in like three verses. Hebrews 1 takes John 1 and puts it on steroids. And so I'd like to open to Hebrews 1 and do a quick run-through of what's going on here. Um, in Hebrews 1. We read in our scripture reading this morning, right? Long ago and many times in many ways, God spoke to our fathers by the prophets, but in these last days he has spoken to us by his Son, whom he appointed heir of all things, through whom also he did what? Created the world. So first thing we get is Christ as creator. Now I'm going to put a little asterisk on this. The technical language is, is that Christ is the agent of, through which God creates the world. And this is classic New Testament. Christ as the agent of creation. Okay? Classic, classic, classic New Testament all over the place. You can go put that one together yourself. But Christ as creator is pointing us in what direction? Only God creates, right? So it's already pushing us in that direction. We continue. He is the radiance of the glory of God. And now the next phrase, the exact imprint of his nature. This is one of the few actual Bible statements about the nature of God. The Hebrew mind generally didn't think in terms of essential nature. It was much more pragmatic. We know God by how he relates to us. It's the Greeks who ask the essential nature questions. So what happens is we read a Hebrew Bible and we try to extract Greek-like principles from it to create a nature of God. And the reality is we don't know what we're talking about. It's almost like the four-year-old who constructs a theory of marriage by watching mommy and daddy in the kitchen, in the car, in the living room, at church, And mommies and daddies, marriage involves big people taking care of little people like me. And they hold hands and they kiss and hug once in a while. And I know they sleep in one bed, like I sleep alone. They sleep side by side. But the reality is, the little child has no clue about marriage in the bedroom the physical and other intimacies that go with marriage. It's not even on their radar screen. Right? And they construct their little theory, and they might even speculate us about what's behind the, the closed bedroom door. But they don't got a clue. And I'd like to suggest that we're in the same go boat. What God is in the bedroom, behind closed doors as a trinity, we don't have a clue. And we need to be careful not to speculate too much and know our limits. And so this is one of the few statements that says something, but it's more about the union of their nature than the exact nature of their nature. He is the exact imprint of his nature. Um, the last word nature is kind of this idea of consistency. and so It's not the same word as the Trinity doctrine, but it suffices. But I go back to the one, he is the exact imprint. The Greek word is character. We get our word character from it. Think like a typewriter character. And you have 
the little A on the typewriter, and then when it strikes, it leaves the exact copy of that image on the paper. And you can tell what this one looks like by looking at the other and vice versa. And he's essentially saying that Christ is that mere image that matches perfectly the nature of God. It's a strong affirmation that Christ by nature is deity. Furthermore, Christ upholds the universe by the word of his power. That's an Old Testament function of God, right? God is sustainer. But here it's Christ who's sustainer. After making purification for sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty of high. I'm reading this because this is a crucial um, chronological marker, right? After making purification for sins, what event is that referencing? The cross. So sometime after the cross, what does he do? He sits down at the right hand of God. And he sits down at the right hand of God to do what functions in the book of Hebrews? High priest. But he's after what order? So what's the other office that goes with Melchizedek? King. So he's being installed as the king priest after the resurrection. And so what we have in Hebrews 1 is a snapshot of the installation ceremony and we have the things that God the Father is saying to God the Son as he's installing him into his office as king priest after the order of Melchizedek. And so we go to verse 5. To which of the angels did God ever say... See, God is speaking at this installation, at this seating. You are my son, today I have begotten you. I got an article on the use of Psalm 2-7, go to Perspective Digest. Verse 6, or again, when he brings the firstborn into the world, let's break this down. Who's the firstborn? Who's the firstborn? Christ. Who's bringing the firstborn? God the Father. Now, by the way, the world here is not the usual world word for this world. In Hebrews, it's the word for the world that's coming. The final world. And the point is, Christ is already being ushered into the final kingdom that will take over everything. And he's being installed as the king and priest of this kingdom. So this is not the incarnation in Hebrews 1.6. Okay. This is all the installation. So when he, the father, brings Christ the firstborn into the world, he says, now again, who's doing the talking here? God the father. He, God says, let all God's angels do what? Worship him. Who is the him? The firstborn. So you have God the Father commanding angels to worship Christ. <clears throat> but you're only supposed to worship God, right? If Christ is not God fully, then the Father is commanding the angels to sin. You follow me? I hit Jehovah's Witnesses so many times as a young pastor in the 1980s, somewhere in the late 90s, they changed their Bible so that it, they fixed this text. I like to take credit for it. It's probably not my fault, but you know. <laughs> because this text, they hadn't fixed like they fixed John 1, right? But their newer Bible from around 1998 or so, 2000 area, they fixed this one. I joke again, I, I've hit so many of them, they go back to the elders, they have no answer. Uh, when, by the way, where else does Jesus get worshipped? Revelation 4 or 5, they worship the Lamb. 
And after the resurrection, when Thomas falls down, what does he say to Jesus? My Lord and my God. Now, when Cornelius fell down to Peter, what did Peter say? Don't do that. You only do that to God. When John fell down before the angel twice in the book of Revelation, what does the angel say? No, 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 only do that to God. But when Thomas does it to Jesus, he does nothing to stop him. If Christ is not God, he should have stopped Thomas. You follow me? And when I have broken through Aryan viewpoints, it's been the worship issue that God commands worship. Jesus received worship unlike Peter and so forth and so on that the Holy Spirit has been able to leverage to get them to receive the fullness of Christ. But he's not done talking yet. We go to verse 8. And what does the Father say to the Son? You're thrown home. We suddenly have God the Father calling the Son God. And what does he say about his existence? Your throne and lasts how long? A statement of the eternity of the Son. Scepter of rightness is the scepter of your kingdom. You have loved righteousness, hated wickedness. Therefore, God, your God, whoops, I got two gods here, <laughs> has anointed you with the oil of gladness beyond your companions. But again, the unending. By the way, don't have time, but if you go down two or three chapters where he's comparing Jesus to the genealogy of Melchizedek, without father, without mother, without end of days, you have another statement of eternity of Christ there. And possibly without beginning and without end. Right? By the way, little bonus. Who's the Alpha and Omega? In Revelation, both God the Father take the title Alpha and Omega and Christ. Both. But if the Father precedes the Son in existence, that would make the Son the Beta and Omega, not the Alpha and Omega. <laughs> I want to focus now on Hebrews 1.10. So after your throne, O God, is forever and ever, etc., verse 10, this is God the Father speaking, you, Lord, laid the foundations of the earth in the beginning. Christ is no longer the agent of creation. He's the creator. But I'm going to come back. The heavens are the work of your hands. They will perish, but you remain. Eternity. They will wear out like a garment, etc. But you are the same. Middle of verse 12. Your years will never end. But I want to go back. What's the second word in English? You what? Lord. We're quoting... I'm so I forget which psalm. I think it's 120. It's either 120 or 122. Take a quick cheat here. Psalm 102, pardon me. Case of dyslexia. Psalm 102. Psalm 102 is a prayer to God using the sacred name that we speculate is pronounced Yahweh. Now, when a good Jew in Hebrew hits the sacred name, you don't say that. Your lips are too unholy to say the sacred name. So they substitute the Hebrew Adonai, my Lord. So when they translated the Old Testament to Greek for the Septuagint, at least all the ones I've looked up, several hundred of them now, 
when they hit those Yahwehs, they put the Greek equivalent of Adonai, Kurios, Lord. They don't even try to transcribe the Yahweh part. They just substitute Kurios, Lord. Now, like Lord, in, you know, Adon, Lord, this could be used of a human Lord, a divine Lord, you know, etc. But in Jewish tradition, Adonai is the plural, following Elohim, as opposed to Adoni, my Lord, singular. Yeah. Adonai is only for God. They're using Kurios, as the sub-Greek equivalent of the Adonai for the Yahweh. And so you have this prayer to God, addressing God, addressing God, and God is... And the Lord here is supplied in the Greek text, but it's picking up the implication of the Hebrew that this is addressing God. This is addressing Yahweh. And by saying that this text is what God the Father is saying to the Son as he's installing him into his kingly priestly office after the resurrection, you have the Father calling the Son Yahweh. Hebrews 1, 10, 11 here is equating Son as co-Yahweh with the Father. Yahweh calls the Son Yahweh. You're like, wow! And this is not the only, this is the most blunt one, but we can think of others, right? When Jesus said to the Jews, before Abraham was, I am, he used the, the Greek equivalent of the first two words of the I am that I am in Exodus. And the Jews understood exactly what he was saying because how did they respond? They picked up stones to execute him for blasphemy. So Jesus links himself to the sacred name. But I... There's a few more we can throw in here. Because the sacred name is tied to the concept of self-existence in the Hebrew. I am. I'm not made. You know, etc. So in John 1, when it says, in him was life. And that life was the light of men. You're ascribing an attribute of Yahweh to Christ, self-existence. Likewise, in John 5, Jesus says, as the Father has life in himself, so he is granted to the Son to have life in himself. And our Trinitarians say, see, it was granted to Christ. God gave him this ability to be self-existent. I'm saying, uh-uh. It was granted to him in his human form to maintain, I lay down my life and pick it up again. He didn't lose that when he became human. Because Jesus said he has life in himself in the same way that the Father has life in himself. Is the Father's life granted from another? No. So for the Son's life to have life in himself the same way that the Father, it has to be an ungranted, unborrowed, underived life. So if that life was granted the way they're saying it was, it's a lie. He would not have the same kind of life in himself that the Father has. So in order for it to be the same kind of life as the Father, it has to be the underived life. But God granted in the subordinate period of the incarnation that Christ retain that power, and hence no one takes my life from me, I lay it down of my own accord, even as a man. Christ has the attributes of Yahweh in the New Testament. Paul, he says that the rock that was with them in the wilderness was whom? 
Christ. But Deuteronomy says the rock is Yahweh. Christ is Yahweh. One more. John 10, I am the good what? Shepherd. Not a hireling, right? But Psalm 23, who is my shepherd? Yahweh is my shepherd, I shall not want. If Christ is not Yahweh, then he is the hireling who was sent by Yahweh. So we take these texts and stuff we don't have time for, you know, the personality of the Holy Spirit who uses language and has a mind and these kinds of things, and we say we find in the Bible three beings who are all divine, all capable, etc., and we don't know how to explain it, it's just there. And we have to accept it as a mystery. So why is the Trinity important? Who cares? Is this just about angels on the head of a pin? How many can dance on the head of a pin? Or is there something more meaningful? By the way, if Christ is Yahweh, he has no beginning. And how is Yahweh subordinate to Yahweh? It doesn't work. I think there are three practical reasons why this is important. Reason number one, I believe the Trinity doctrine plays the same function as the second commandment, not to make idols. Second commandment not to make idols, I believe, is designed to keep us from boxing God into our little constructs. God is too big for you to box into your head. And the Trinity doctrine is just another way of telling you the same thing. You'll never figure out God. Because the moment you think you've got God figured out, that's the moment you can manipulate and control your God. And our God is too big for us to manipulate and control. Second one... I believe that God comes to us in three persons because without that, we would end up with an unbalanced view of God. While the Father has taken on the specialty of kind of the shock and awe, you know, Isaiah 6, uh, woe is me, I'm unclean, you know, the judge and the power, and Jesus has taken on the more intimate, close friend, etc., and the Holy Spirit is kind of the mysterious can't quite figure out who you are. It's clear that if they're all three equally God, any one of them could have taken on any of those roles. But God knew that if we related only to the father dimension, we would end up like Martin Luther, terrified of God. On the other hand, if all we relate to is Jesus, we end up like many Protestants. Jesus is my friend and there's no sovereignty of God whatsoever and I can do as I please. Or, if I'm all Holy Spirit, I end up like the Pentecostals with lots of fervor and emotion, but loss of sovereignty and other issues. Extreme subjectivism. Few people, by the way, remember the Christ of Revelation, who is the Lamb who makes war and judges, is the same gentle Jesus of the Gospels, right? We forget that. The Trinity makes us reckon with all the attributes of God that we could easily dismiss if God were only one person and we focus on one nuance. And I think for having a well-rounded view of God, we need that all three aspects. And it helps us avoid the ditches that so many are falling into today uh, in Christianity and Adventism in general. So keeps us humble, we know our limits, we don't box God into our constructs, balanced view of God, and to me, it diminishes the power of the gospel.
Because the gospel is based on the idea of Philippians 2. Who being in very nature God. Didn't count equality with God something to clutch and hang on to. But emptied himself of that equality. And took the form of a servant. And went to the cross. The bad news is that God will not sacrifice his kingdom to save man. The good news is he sacrificed himself. And to serve a God who will empty himself for enemies to try to save them. There is a glory to that story Whereas if Christ came under orders of a higher authority as a hireling, he lose the glory. There's a reason he's called Emmanuel, God. With us. And the Trinity reminds me that Christ is fully, essentially, as much God as the Father. And it reminds me of the phenomenal sacrifice in his very existence that he made to save wretched souls like you and me. That's why the Trinity matters. Let's sing about that incarnation in our closing hymn. Let's stand and turn our hymnals to 117. All three stanzas. session after the service let us pray Lord we are so thankful that you're a personal God that you did not send an angel but you came yourself for the worst of the worst and the chiefs of sinners that we all are may that move our hearts I pray in Jesus' name, let God's people say.